Hello, everybody, and welcome. This is the last in our series of six webinars on, Ameri on Jewish language and names. And today, I am pleased that we have with us a guest host, and that is my friend Esther Kustanowitz, who is a wonderful writer and co-host of Jewish pop culture podcast, The Bagel Report. You can catch her this Sunday at Limud's E-Festival, speaking about TV Gone Jewy. And I am Professor Sarah Bunin Benor from Hebrew Union College from the Jewish Language Project. And I am going to be talking today about Jewish personal names. I'm going to share my screen with you so you can see the opening question, which is actually something that I'm, I'd like you to write in the chat. And that is, please write the name of someone in your family, just one person, and who they're named after. I give you some examples here, like it could be Carly named after Carl, or Sam Henry named after Sam and Henry, or Michaela, whose Hebrew name is Esther, named after Estelle, whose Hebrew name is Esther. So just take a minute and do that. And Esther, I'm gonna ask you to read out for us the, uh, what, we, what we have in the chat. You got it, Sarah. Um, so we've got Dina named after Dina uh, in the Torah, Adeline named after Abraham, Corin for Cameron, my daughter Rachel named after our great grandmother Rachel, Rachel, sorry. Uh, we will always now it's just getting fast. Jerome for Jesse, Miriam for Miriam, James, whose name is British, exactly the opposite of the Jewish name, question mark. Uh, Jeffrey for Yehuda, David after great grandmother Devorah, uh, Catherine Barbara, Kayla Bela. That sounds great. I, I, my, I'm Deborah, named after Bible Deborah, Kevin for Kalman, Cheryl. Okay, hey, okay, that's yeah. great. So uh, I know we have a lot of participants now. We could do this for the entire hour and that would be fun. Uh, but what we see here is a lot of people named after someone with the same letter or perhaps with um, some other characteristic. Like in, in my list here, I included Ari named after Leon because they both mean lion or Rina meaning song named after her great grandfather who loves music. Uh, so we see here the main points of my talk, which is the assimilation and distinctiveness. We see that the names that you mentioned, a lot of them are common American names and a lot of them are not. A lot of them are names that are distinctly Jewish, that are Hebrew, biblical, perhaps a bunch of Yiddish names were in that list. So this is a common thread throughout history that Jews have used both distinctive Jewish names and names that are similar to those of their non-Jewish neighbors. And along with this, we also have the dual trends of tradition and creativity that Jews have maintained or in, invoked names from ancient Hebrew in creative ways, often by using those techniques that you just showed us in your names, that either they were the similar sound or similar meaning or some other connection. And as you can see, contemporary Jews are continuing these traditions. So I'm gonna demonstrate these points by talking about history and contemporary Jews. When we talk about history, I'm gonna talk about the sources of personal names and the distinctive features of those names. And then when we talk about contemporary Jews, we'll talk about their preferences and patterns by looking at baby names and pets names. Okay, are we ready? Yes, we are. So Jewish history. The names that we see throughout Jewish history come from Hebrew and Aramaic, which are sometimes hard to tell apart. So we talk about them as one language, the holy tongue, and from local languages, and then from local languages that were once local. Or to put it in another, another way, the names come from Jewish texts, and that could be characters in the Tanakh or in rabbinic literature. Or it could be words that are in those traditions but are not names until Jews make them into names. And then names can come from local languages and cultures, or they can be migrated names that came from languages and cultures that Jews 
were part of historically. So I'll give you some examples of all of these. First, the Tanakh. So obviously we have names like Yitzchak and Rivka and their derivatives, which could be the local surrounding society's version of those names because biblical names have made it into many cultures, especially in Christian dominated areas. So names like Isaac and Rebecca, but also Isaac and Becky, and then Jewish diminutive forms of these like Yitz or Itzikol, Ricky and Riva. And then we have less common names from the Tanakh like Yigal, Shabtai, Shulamit, and Yiska. Then here are some examples of names from rabbinic texts, from Hebrew Meir and Bruria, from rabbinic Aramaic Kiva, which I just learned is Aramaic for Yaakov, huh. and Chagai and Chanina. And then interestingly, there was a hiatus historically. Some biblical names were not used for centuries after the early rabbinic period until the revival of Hebrew names in the 12th century, which happened both in the Middle East and in Europe. Names like Avraham, Asher, David, Joel, Solomon, these names were not used in the 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th centuries, which is kind of interesting because often we think of it as a um, continuity that these names have been used since antiquity. But we have to think about events that happened in history and the 12th century revival of interest in Hebrew was one of those interesting discontinuities. So here are some examples of words from textual Hebrew that were not originally the names of characters in those texts. Names like Shira, Rachamim, Simcha, Naim and Malka. And these are positive qualities. Names from nature like Dov, Tzvi, Margalit, and Livia. Theophoric names, and we see some of these in the Bible like Daniel and Emmanuel, but we also see some that came, came across, came out later like Batya, Eliav, and Eliana. And we also have feminized versions of boys' names, like Kalmane, which was found in 18th century Prague, Pine or Pinke or Pince, which is short for Pinchas, found in 19th century Poland. And in our contemporary times, names like Daniela, Ariela, and Amira. We also have non-Jewish origin names that come to be interpreted as Hebrew because of homophony, that is similarity in sound. For example, there's a name called Schneer, Schneor. And that name actually, it's a Yiddish name that comes from Romance languages, from Signor, but it comes to be interpreted as Schneor, two lights. And it comes to be seen as a Hebrew name. And men also used that as their religious name, considering it to be Hebrew. We also have examples of this from our uh, American society today. Names like Amalia, which is an international name, but comes to be interpreted as Amalia, work of God. Maya, which is an international name coming, that comes to be interpreted as water. Evan, Aiden, and Lila are other examples. And here we see these trends that I'm talking about. We see the tradition of using a Hebrew name and the creativity of linking contemporary names to our tradition of using Hebrew names. And these are names that are common throughout our society. So we see that Jews are able to integrate into the local society, but also maintain their distinctiveness sometimes in coded ways. And in contemporary times, we have an additional layer of Hebrew words, and that is modern Hebrew from Israeli society today. Names like Ahuva, Dror, Gal, and Ami. And interestingly, contemporary American Jews don't tend to use the same names that Israelis are using now, but they tend to be a few decades behind in the names that they prefer. For example, my oldest daughter is named Aliza, and some Israelis think, oh yeah, that's 
an old lady's name, <laughs> but my daughter is only 17. So another interesting trend in naming is using names to ward off evil or to heal. This is especially common when children got sick or when people got sick that they would take on a new name, sometimes in addition to their name or sometimes to replace it. And we see this with names that mean life like Chaim and Chaya, and those can be from Hebrew, but also from local languages like Vita and Vidal, but also names meaning old like Alte and Zede, and names meaning healing like Raphael. But not all Jews have used names that are from Hebrew or seen as distinctly Jewish. Even in antiquity, we have evidence that Jews used local non-Jewish names. For example, the names Moshe and Pinchas and other names in the tribe of Levi are actually Egyptian in their origin. Of course, they've come to be seen as Hebrew names. But perhaps when those names were first used, people identified those names as Egyptian in origin. And we also see this in the book of Esther. The names Esther and Mordechai are based on Babylonian deities Ishtar and Marduk. Many rabbis in the Talmud have Aramaic or Greek names, showing that they're not all continuing this biblical practice of using Hebrew names. Names like Akiva, Yose, Shammai, Simon, instead of Shimon, Antigonos, and Petros. In fact, there's a Midrash where the rabbis complain about Jews changing their names. They say that the ancient Israelites were redeemed, were worthy of redemption from Egypt because they did not change their names or their language. And also other things, they did not engage in licentiousness and Lashon Hara, evil speech. But what's interesting is they talked about their names and they gave examples. They say, for example, Yehuda did not change his name to Rupa. Reuven did not change his name to Luliani. And Binyamin did not change his name to Alexandri. Now, of course, that was not referring to the ancient Israelites who were redeemed from Egypt because these are Greek and Roman names. And so they were the rabbis were referring to the people around them. And they anytime the rabbis say, don't do this, it means that the Jews were doing it. So clearly the Jews were taking on local Hellenistic names instead of their traditional Hebrew names. And in fact, the Babylonian Talmud says the names of most Jews outside of the land of Israel are like the names of the Jews. And this continues in the 10th century in Cairo, we have lists of names and these include several Hebrew names like Ezra, Aaron, Esther, and Hannah, and several Arabic forms of biblical Hebrew names like Yaqub and Daoud. But it also includes non-biblical Arabic names like Abdullah, which is potentially a translation of Ovadia, servant of God, Hassan, Jamila, Surura, and even Muhammad. In 16th century Rome, we have Hebrew names like Esther, Rachel, Aaron, David, and also Italian forms of biblical Hebrew names like Benjamino and Giuseppe. But we also have non-biblical Italian names like Allegrezza, Gentile, and Angelo. And keep track of that Gentile name because that's going to come up again in a minute. So there's also this practice of having, of an individual having two names. Sometimes in antiquity, this meant that they had separate names for their life in the Jewish community and for their life in the broader world. Their Jewish name would be Hebrew and Aramaic, Hebrew or Aramaic, and their name for the broader world would be Greek and Latin. In the Middle Ages and early modern period, this two name thing manifested differently. It was men had a Shem HaKodesh, their holy name that they used for ritual purposes, and a Kinoi, their nickname, that they used in communal internal affairs and in external affairs. And that name could be from, it could be a form of their Hebrew and Aramaic name, or it could be a Yiddish name or an Arabic name or, or some other name. 
And women didn't follow this pattern generally in this period because they didn't need ritual names. So few of them had separate Jewish and general names in, in those periods. But then in, from the 19th century to the present, we see that ancient pattern coming back that many Jews had separate names that they used for their life in the Jewish community and for their life in the broader world. So we see these combined trends of assimilation and distinctiveness. And here's a little image that my daughter made for me on my request. Uh, just take a minute and look at that. So really Esther, also known as Hadassah, had her, her Jewish name Hadassah and her Starbucks name Esther, right? The name that she uses in her interactions with the broader world. So sometime, let me give you some examples of name pairings throughout history. Uh, in the book of Daniel, we learn that Daniel and his friends went to Babylonia and were given Babylonian names. Daniel got the name Belteshazzar. And sometimes we see people like Asher taking on a name like Anselmos, so it's based on sound. Charlotta, Scheindel, Baruch, Benedict, which is based on sound, but also based on meaning because they both mean blessed. And Yehuda, named Leo because of the symbolic associations. The lion is a symbol of the tribe of Judah. And that symbolic association has been going on throughout history. We see this from ancient Rome till the 18th century in, in Mainz, in the Byzantine Empire, Southern France, Portugal, Florence, Hungary. It's, it's just amazing how Jews throughout history have had that connection of the name Yehuda and a name that means lion. So even if these names seemed like local non-Jewish names, they might have been coded as Jewish. We also see the double name thing happening in, in a slightly different way, which is hyphenated names. And this doesn't mean it's their first name and their middle name. It means they actually had two first names. A very common one in modern Central and Eastern Europe is Chaya Sara. And that might sound familiar, and that's because there's a Parsha, a portion that we read in the Torah called Chaye Sara, and that it had an influence on the name Chaya Sara as a joint name. Others include Fruma Sara, Chana Fagel, Yehuda Leib. There again, we see the lion connection, Tzvi Hirsch, and Dov Bear. And the, the men's versions of those names uh, on the bottom there are all translation. Tzvi is Hebrew, Hirsch is Germanic, they both mean deer. Dove, bear, they both mean bear. And interestingly, when we're talking about Jews having names from the local language, sometimes it was names that non-Jews also had, but sometimes it was names that they made up from the local language. Here are some that were made up by Jews in Germanic speaking areas and were not used by local non-Jews. Suskind, sweet child, Zelikman, blessed man, Shena, beautiful, and Perla, pearl. Another distinctive feature of Jewish names is that sometimes Jews continue to use names after they're no longer popular among non-Jews. For example, here are some names that were popular among Christians in 12th century Germany for a while, but then they went out of fashion. But Jews continued to use them for centuries in Germany and then as they moved eastward toward Poland and other Slavic speaking countries. Names like Duva, also known as Toibe or Taibele, meaning dove, or Fischl, meaning fish. And we also see this in the United States. In the early 20th century, when Jews arrived in the United States, they often took on names for themselves or for their children that were not so common among the local non-Jews anymore, but they became quite common among Jews. And so they came to be seen as Jewish names, names like Irving and Bessie. Another type of name is migrated names. That is names where that Jews took on in a certain location, a certain part of the world, 
and then maintained after they migrated to a new location in the diaspora. So for example, in the ancient Middle East, Jews took on the names Esther, Alexander, Kalman, and Todros, which were from Babylonian or Persian and, and Greek. These are non-Jewish origin names that come to be considered Hebrew and they're even used as ritual names. These names are maintained for many centuries, and so we do still have Jews today named Esther and Alexander. I don't know a lot of Jews named Todros. I know a few named Kalman. And then when Jews lived in the Romance-speaking world, especially in medieval Spain, France, and Italy, they took on many Romance names and they kept many of these when they moved to Ashkenaz, to Germanic speaking lands. Names like Reina Tulce, which means sweet, comes from Dulce. Uh, Yenta, which comes from that Italian name Gentile that I mentioned before, meaning gentle, not Gentile. Uh, Fivush, which comes from Vivus, meaning vivacious or, or alive, life, and schneer that I mentioned before from senior. And then when Jews moved from Germanic lands to Slavic lands, they of course maintained many of their Germanic names just as they maintained many of their Germanic words in, in their Yiddish language. Uh, names like Wolf, Lemel, Freyde, and Liebe. And then when Jews moved from Eastern Europe to the United States and to other parts of the world, they maintained many of their Yiddish origin names like Shana, Rezel, Reina, Kalman, Zalman, and Zelig. So another interesting aspect of this whole conversation is that we've been talking about sources of names, but some names have multiple sources. For example, the name Bina. Bina probably comes from an Italian or French name, Bona, meaning good. And Romance Jews, Romance speaking Jews brought this name to Germanic lands. But Christians also used it in some Germanic regions, also in, influenced by Romance language. And Germanic speaking Jews then brought that name to Slavic land lands and it changed in its pronunciation from bona to bone to bune to bine based on sound changes in the language but because of the sound similarity between bine and the yiddish word for bee it came to be associated with the name devora the biblical deborah why because the word devora means bee like bumblebee and so does the yiddish word bean and it also came to be influenced by the German named Biene, which was a nickname for Sabina. So when somebody named their child Biene in Eastern Europe or Central Europe, they might have had any of these connotations in mind. I would have liked to be there when they were talking about what to name their children. We can do that kind of research for contemporary Jews, but we can't do that for historical um, situations. There is some evidence in, in literature and in uh, historical documents, but we, we, won't, we won't know their motivations in the same way that we'll know the, that for contemporary people. But then interestingly, this name changed again in the modern period because Yiddish speaking Jews brought the name to the United States and it came to be interpreted as a Hebrew word, Bina, which means wisdom. So if you are interested in using the name Bina, you would benefit from learning about its fascinating multiple sourced history. And again, we see the trends of assimilation and distinctiveness that Jews are using a name that has influences from local uses of that name, but using it in quite distinctive ways and using it in creative ways, incorporating the Yiddish and Hebrew into their use of this name. We also see gender differences. We see that men are more likely to have biblical names and women are more likely to have names from local languages. Take a minute and think about why that might be.
So why is that? Well, first, women did not need Hebrew ritual names. So it makes sense that they would be less likely to have those biblical names. But also because there are many more biblical names for men than for women. Over 2,700 for men and only about 50 for women. There are also geographic differences. I'm sure many of you know that Ashkenazim and Central Asian Jews named after deceased relatives and Sephardim and some Mizrahi Jews name after living relatives. And even though this seems like a difference, it also is an example of unity because all of these groups are naming after relatives. And this leads to the preservation of certain names throughout the centuries. Again, an example of both tradition and creativity. So now we turn to contemporary American Jews. What sources are contemporary American Jews using? Well, the same sources that we've been talking about this whole time. The texts, the Hebrew words, the migrated languages, in this case Yiddish, there aren't a lot of migrated names from Ladino or Judeo-Arabic or other languages. Um, and of course, the local language and culture. Some of the names that you gave at the beginning are American names, right? And in, when we're talking about the Hebrew words, American Jew Jews do have that added layer of uh, names from contemporary Israel. And we also have some of the same patterns using two names, the English name and the Jewish name or the Hebrew name, right? Which can also be a Yiddish name um, or our regular name if it's a name from Hebrew or Yiddish and then a Starbucks name as our name that we use in our uh, in some interactions where people might have trouble pronouncing our names. We also see creative connections between English and Hebrew names and creative ways of naming after relatives. So what are the strategies that, that people are using? Well, we talked about those at the beginning, but I want to give you another example from my own daughter, Ariella, who is sitting there in the middle of this picture, that little pink blob there who is now studying for her bat mitzvah. <laughs> um, but her name is Ariella and Ariella is named after my grandfather Yehuda Leib, the lion lion connection, right? Um, and he, his English name was Leon and Ariella means lioness, right? So that's why we have that connection. And we also see another interesting aspect with American Jews naming patterns that the baby name choices and preferences reflect their Jewish identity. I have data on this from two different surveys that I conducted. The first one was from 2008, a survey I conducted with Stephen Cohen that had over 25,000 responses. And we gave a prompt, we gave a list, we gave several lists of names and we said, Below, we list several groups of children's names. Imagine for a moment that you were thinking of a name for your child or grandchild. For each group, please indicate how likely you would be to choose names like these. And then the data that I'm gonna to present to you now are the percent of respondents in each group among those under age 45 who say that they would be likely or somewhat likely to use names like these. So first, the names that we thought would be considered very non-Jewish, Christopher, John, Christine, and Mary. And we see that these are pretty common among non-Jews, but very uncommon among non-Orthodox, modern Orthodox, and Haredi Jews. Haredi means ultra-Orthodox, black hat. Then some trendy names from 2008, like Tyler, Dylan, Michaela, and Madison. And we see that again, these are more common among non-Jews, and again, these are the preferences for these names, right? So non-Jews are much more likely to use these than others, and Orthodox hardly at all. And then we see a similar pattern, but getting a little closer now with the non-Orthodox Jews for Alex, Julian, Zoe, and Ella. 
But then when we get to biblical names, we see a switch. Now Jews are more likely to use these than non-Orthodox Jews. Names like Jacob, Ethan, Hannah, and Abigail, which were quite popular in 2008. But we see that Haredi Jews are still not likely to use those names, even though they're biblical, because they are not as common in the traditional naming patterns of those communities. <clears throat> a bit more among the Haredim for this other set of biblical names that is not as trendy, but has been common since the 1980s, Joshua, Daniel, Sarah, and Rebecca. And then we see the opposite trend for Ezra, Ari, Talia, and Eliana, which are the kinds of names that I named my children. Uh, so these are names that are not common among non-Jews, as you can see here, but are quite common among Orthodox Jews. So I'm in that almost 50% of non-Orthodox respondents who report using uh, names like these, interest in names like these. And finally, Yiddish names like Moisha, Mendi, Basia, and Freydi, we see that these are quite common among Haredi Jews and pretty rare among all the other groups. But I would like to meet that 1% of non-Jews who wants to name their kids Moisha, Mendi, Basia, and Freydi. Who knows, maybe the names will catch on. So then results from my other survey, and you are the first people to see these results because this study hasn't actually been released yet. We're still working on analyzing it. This was from a survey of American Jewish names and the names of their children and their pets. And we had over 11,000 respondents. And today I'm gonna to be presenting you for you a subset of the respondents, 4,000, 639 who identify as Jewish and have at least one child, okay? And the percentage that I'm gonna show you is the percent whose first child has a name that's Hebrew or Yiddish. And this can also include English versions of biblical Hebrew names. And we see that this percentage correlates pretty strongly with various Jewish identity markers, including denomination. So here we see that Secular humanist and reform Jews are much less likely than Orthodox Jews to use these Jewish names. We also see it correlates with synagogue attendance. The more frequently people attend synagogue, the more likely they are to give a name that is distinctively Jewish or biblical to their child. We also see a correlation with the percent of their close friends who are Jewish. And we see a correlation with time spent in Israel. The more time they spent in Israel, the more likely they are to use a Hebrew or Jewish name. So American Jews today are continuing the age old practice of using Hebrew names, local names, and both often in creative ways. So we see this assimilation and distinctiveness. And the names that parents choose for their babies are one way that they express their Jewish identities. When they introduce their child to the world at a naming ceremony or in any social interaction throughout their lives, they send a message. They are saying, I am a Jew, but I'm also a certain type of Jew. So now we turn to our most fun part of our talk, which is pets names. Now, most Jews give in America give their pets American names like Chase and Coco, but some Jews, especially rabbis, Jewish educators, and those with many Jewish friends, choose identifiably Jewish names. And I have survey data on this too. We asked a question on our survey, have any of your pets had names that you consider Jewish? And here's what we found. The answer to that question correlates strongly with the percent of their friends that are Jewish, those that have more Jewish friends are more likely to use Jewish names for their pets. And even more strongly, it correlates with their role as a Jewish professional. Those who are Jewish professionals or Jewish studies educator, educators, Jewish studies scholars, rabbis, or cantors are much more likely than others to use Jewish names for their pets. So what does that mean, Jewish names for their pets? Well. 
there are a few ways that people do this. One is historical Jewish figures. There are many pets named Rashi. In fact, I know of seven dogs and one gecko named Rashi. Rashi is, of course, a medieval rabbi and Jewish commentator, one of the most important rabbis in our tradition. And it makes sense that a dog would have that name. And people report who have animals named Rashi report that this is an op a teaching opportunity. They're walking their dog. What's your dog's name? Rashi. Oh, that's interesting. What's that? A medieval Jewish commentator. And of course, there are more contemporary historical Jewish figures like Miss Ruthie Bader Ginsburg. May she live and be well. Another historical figure uh, combination, this time a pair of rabbits. Their English names are Oreo and Cookie, and their Hebrew names are Hillel and Shammai. And this was a compromise because one of the children wanted them to be named Oreo and Cookie, the other wanted them to have more Hebrew names. And so they took a play from the rabbinic playbook and came up with a compromise. And then there's Golda Meow, uh, named after Golda Meir, of course. She did lose an eye, uh, she had an infection, and she is actually quite a famous cat. She has a, uh, a website, a, a Facebook page that's, that's, that's very popular. And um, that is another example of a historical figure, but it's also an example of wordplay. And I think that's a great example of the creativity that Jews have used throughout history. We're not just the people of the book, we're also the people of the pun. Another type of Jewish names of pets is food names. These dogs are named Latka, Macaroon, and Bialy, for example. And here's a dog from a Sephardic family named Boreka. And so names of, of animals that have um, food names is kind of interesting because you, know, you don't actually wanna eat your animal, but it is a common trend in American life in general, naming your dog something like Biscuit, right? Using a food name for your dog and using names from the um, historical Jewish traditions, the historical Jewish foodways shows that Jews find those things important. Another type of pet name is a characteristic. So uh, animals named Motek, Suris, and Nitsi Klug, not so smart. Here are two cats who are named based on their characteristics, Lev and Safam. If you look closely at the picture, you'll see that the one on the left has a heart-shaped nose, and Lev means heart, and the one on the right has a mustache. Safam means mustache. Another type of name for a pet is using non-English animal terms. And in fact, this is also a common American trend when um, people look at websites, what should I name my animal? Sometimes they suggest using names for that animal in other languages. And because of Jews, multilingual, past and present, they uh, sometimes use names from Hebrew, Yiddish, and Aramaic. Kelev means dog. Tuki means parrot, Ketzala is Yiddish for little cat, and Shunra is Aramaic for cat from the Chad Gad Ya song. Ata Shunra, Deachla Legad Ya, right? Um, and sometimes people are silly with these kinds of things and they'll name a cat Kelev or something like that. Another type of name that is sometimes not as comedic is biblical names. So just naming your animal with a name like Jethro or Amos, which are not as common among humans, uh, or naming it something from the Tanakh, from the Bible, that isn't a name, but is a, a concept like Nachamu. Somebody named her cat Nachamu after her brother had died, and Nachamu means comfort, be comforted, my people. And this, was, this cat brought great comfort to her after the death of her brother. Here is a biblical animal uh, named Queen Vashti, who just like her biblical namesake is refusing to dance or continue with her walk. 
Other religious concepts are commonly expressed in names of animals, names like mitzvah, matzah, and afikomen. Sometimes name animals that are acquired on a particular holiday get a name that is related to that holiday, holiday, like the cat that arrived right around Passover and kept hiding under the couch, got the name afikomen. And here's another sweet story. Uh, a woman got a cat after her husband had died and named the cat Tikva. And this cat really was her hope for survival during a very difficult time in her life. And then later on, she found out that there was a children's book that had been written around the time that she got her cat about a cat named Tikva. And the cat looked almost exactly like the cat that she had herself. Tikva means hope. And we have other Jewish identified names and words that are used for animal names like dreidel, shiksa, meaning non-Jewish woman, and lochenkopf, meaning a hole in the head. That person needed a new cat like she needed a lochenkopf. <laughs> and here's Tishbi, which is named for this couple's favorite Israeli wine company. And here is Maxi, whose Jewish name is Alta Cocker because she is an old cocker spaniel and alta cocker means old pooper, but uh, she has the personality of an alta cocker. So we see in these uh, names of pets, similarities to American pet names more broadly. We see characteristics like spot and snowball, and that's actually an ancient trend, naming cows and and other livestock after something that identifies them. Uh, food names like biscuit and peanut, puns on celebrity names like Drulius Caesar, Rosa Barks, and Kitty Purry. And the use of personal names for pets is actually a new trend that only started in the 1980s, naming your dog Bella or Jimmy, for example. And we see that common among Jews as well, but often using specifically Jewish names. So in addition to these similarities, we also have distinctive features that the Jewish names we see for pets are more multilingual and have some specifically Jewish references. So again, the combined trends of assimilation and distinctiveness. So Although Jews are highly, are relatively integrated into American society, many intentionally highlight their Jewishness through their pets' names, which sometimes leads to teachable moments. And we see the resources for distinctiveness, the biblical and rabbinic texts, the values, historical figures, Israel, and nostalgia for the old country, for foods and for the Yiddish language. And these demonstrate some aspects that are important to American Jews. So in conclusion, the names that Jews have given to their children and their pets reflect their dual trends of assimilation and distinctiveness, which are important for a minority group. And contemporary Jews are continuing the traditions of Jews throughout history and adding some new creative twists. Our names express both our Americanness and our Jewishness, as well as our specific brand of Jewishness. And of course, we see similar trends in language, which I've spoken about over the last few weeks, and other cultural domains like food, music, and art. That's it. Now I look forward to your questions and comments. So Esther, please uh, unmute yourself and tell me what questions I should start answering. That was fascinating. I, I, there was a lot of robust conversation and a lot of people have a lot to say. So okay. I've got a couple of questions for you. I don't know if we'll get to all of them, but um, one of the things that came up was um, that there was a question about whether giving Jewish names to pets either expresses ambivalence about Jewishness itself or is could be considered by some to be an insult? That's a great question. I, I haven't heard that. Um, I imagine some people feel that way because many Jews do not give their pets Jewish names. And in fact, 
it's less common among Orthodox Jews to have pets in general. And those that do have pets, it's less common for them to give them Jewish names. Um, so, but you certainly see that among Jews who are newly Orthodox, that some of them insist that they want to keep their pet and show their newfound appreciation for Orthodoxy or Jewishness by giving them a Jewish name. Um, I don't think that when people use those Jewish names, they're showing any kind of um, negativity about Judaism. And I think an, a piece of evidence for that is that it's much more common among rabbis and Jewish educators than others. Um, we had a question about how, uh, how certain names became Jewish. Um, we had one about the Russian name Baba um, and one about how the name Bernie, which we associate to be so Jewy, for lack of a better word, um, you know, how that became considered Jewish. Yeah, well, so Baba or Bobe means grandmother, and that is a Slavic word that became part of Yiddish and is still used in Jewish English today to mean grandmother. Uh, I'm not sure if it's used as a name as well. I think it, I think it might be. I think that Yes, it is actually. That is one of those um, names that is used to ward off evil or illness, um, like Alte or Zeta. Um, yes, Boba is used for that. And then Bernie is one of these names like Irving and Bessie that, that is, was very common among Jews in the early 20th century and their children. And came to be seen by some as a Jewish name. Not everybody named Bernard or Bernie is a Jew, but it, it, has, it has that association because it was so common. Often that would be as a translation or an American equivalent of Baruch or Bear or Dove Bear. And just to one of the comments that just came in about, about owning dogs, I'm, some of us who have seen Stissel will know that there was a significant moment where yeah. um, the, grand, the father was like scandalized that somebody would bring a dog into the house. So the, probably that there are communities in which dogs are not, you know, they're certainly not people and they're not supposed to live in a house and they're not supposed to have Jewish names. Yeah, um, exactly. Just one comment about that. Um, one of the participants in my research about Jewish pets names is an Orthodox Jew who uh, lives in an Orthodox community and her dog is one of the only dogs in the community and she actually runs desensitization sessions for the members of her community because there is a great fear of dog in dogs in many Orthodox communities stemming back to the times in Eastern Europe where where um, Russian officials would use dogs to intimidate Jews and uh, and there are also concerns about maintaining caring for the dog on the Sabbath and so um, those are some reasons that they're not as common in Orthodox communities but I think they're becoming more common. And another question about about animals. We love animals here. Um, in, in the Talmud or earlier Jewish literature, are there animals with names? Oh, great question. I don't know. I have to look into that. Okay. Well, we can answer Tom Fieldsmeyer when you get when you get there. Oh, answer. okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and there uh, there were a lot of questions of varying sorts. So I'm just going to throw out a couple of them. And um, so, did you ask Jews of color about their naming preferences? Yes, we don't have that data yet. We're still analyzing it, but we absolutely um, sought out um, Jews of color by contacting organizations geared toward Jews of color. We asked about race, so we'll be able to have, we'll have data on that. Okay, and is there a generational difference in choosing fewer Jewish names during, like right after periods of anti-Semitism and then returning to them? Um, because somebody was noticing that that might be a trend. Well, I do have some historical data on that. Um, Jews born before 1970 were much less likely to have Jewish names than Jews born after 1970. And, and that, uh, especially in the Orthodox community, actually, I'll show you some data on this, okay? Uh, do we have time? Yeah, we have time. So I'm gonna share my screen and show you some data about this. So um, I, I looked at the social security data in New York state. We don't have data on 
Jewish identity or Orthodox identity from the Social Security Administration, we do have it about race, but not about Jewishness. But so I looked at New York State because it has the largest number and higher con highest concentration of Jews and Orthodox Jews. <clears throat> and I looked at baby names um, that some that are used almost exclusively by Orthodox Jews, like Malki, Yehudis, and Mushka, Menachem, Yisrael, Yitzchak, and some that are used mostly by Orthodox Jews. And here's what I found. From 1910 to 1941, there were zero tokens of all of these names. The 1940s to 60s, a few. And then a huge increase starting in the 1970s. So just look at this data. This is awesome. Um, these are the girls' names, and we see just around 1970, uh, late 60s, early 70s is when they start to rise. And here are the boys' names, the same kind of graph. Uh, Moshe is, is up, up at the top and Chaim. Um, and so what's going on here? Well, first, an increase in insularity that um, from the 1910s to the 1940s, public, uh, Orthodox Jews tended to attend public schools and used names like Judah, Isaac, Hannah, et cetera, but also some American names like Charles, James, Barbara, and Marilyn. And some of them would use their Hebrew and Yiddish names informally, like the official name would be American, but their communal internal name would be Hebrew or Yiddish. And then from the mid 1940s to 60s, we see an influx of Orthodox refugees and um, they started to go to private Jewish schools speaking Yiddish. They likely had separate official and informal names, like they would be named Solomon, but Shloimi would be what they, they would be known as in the community. And then from the 1970s to the present, we see a process of Haredization or sliding to the right as scholars refer to it. Um, less emphasis on secular education, more gender segregation, et cetera but also a very highly increased birth rate. And we have stronger cultural connections to Eastern Europe, more Yiddish words, Ashkenazi pronunciations and names. So that is just a little bit of data about Orthodox Jews, but we also see this in non-Orthodox communities that people use, um, like for example, when, um, in, in my generation, a lot of my friends have names that are not specifically Jewish, um, but in, the, in my children's generation, most of us who are highly engaged in Jewish communal life use, or a lot more of us use names that are distinctively Jewish. In terms of antisemitism, I don't know if now, um, given the rise in anti-Semitism in America, I don't know if that's going to lead to people using less Jewish names. It will, we'll have to wait and see. We'll do research about that historically later. I have a couple of questions about gender. So um, one of them is um, among male and female names, was one or the other more likely to remain Jewish than the other? Um, there's something based on a slide that you gave about how more men had biblical names and women had more local names. And did girls and women not need uh, Jewish or ritual names for ketubot, uh, for marriage contracts and for gravestones and pr presumably other parts of Jewish yeah. life? Yeah, my understanding is they did not, that, that until modern times, uh, their marriage contracts and, and gravestones would, would just use their name, whatever it was. But starting in the 19th century, they did start to have separate names for um, Jewish ritual purposes and for their general life. But um, I have this great book, it's really heavy, by um, Alexander Bader. Is that backwards? Oh my gosh, am I mirroring? Are those letters backwards? Huh. Okay. Well, anyway, um, you don't have to read it, but um, it, it's, it's a huge book listing names in Ashkenazi communities. The men's section is bigger than the women's section, but just leafing through the men's section, most of the names are Hebrew. And leaving through the women's section, most of the names are not Hebrew. So it, it's definitely the case. And that's also true in, in Middle Eastern countries. And um, I, I, I'm looking forward to doing that analysis on the name data from the United States as well. Okay. Um, we've got a question, two more questions about specific names. Um, the origin of Jason, 
and uh, that Irving, Bernard, and Sylvia started as Yankee names, and maybe when the Jews started to use them, then the non-Jews stopped using them. So is, is there any truth to that? Yeah, I think that is true. Um, and I think part of it is just that names go in phases and and that uh, at the time when immigrants were taking on these names for themselves and for their children, um, they they were becoming less popular among among the broader population. And certainly that decrease in popularity could have had to do with the fact that they were becoming more common in Jewish communities. And what was the other part of the question? Uh, Jason. Oh, Jason. And not just its origin, but why it has become so popular, it seems. Yeah. Well, the origin, uh, I mean, it's its a Greek name, right? And it's one of the, the high priests. So uh, it is a historically Jewish name in that sense. Um, why is it so popular now? It has to do with general naming patterns in America. Um, in around, I think, 2000 or so, there was this trend of names that sound like Jason like Hayden, Caden, Brayden, Jason, like the similar sound pattern. And so that's why that name is so popular now as part of that sound pattern trend. Wow, that's great. Um, there are a couple more questions and we're done We're done at five, right? So, yeah. so we're just gonna squeak them in under the bell. Okay. Um, so uh, one of them is about the difference between Ashkenazi and Sephardi naming structure and like how that influences trends. In America in particular, or it didn't specify? Uh, it didn't say. Um, well, so there, of course, is, is the difference about naming after people who are still alive and people who have died. Um, and of course, Yiddish is more common among Ashkenazi Jews than other communities. Um, and aside from that, I, I don't have data on that yet, but that's something that we're going to look at in the, the name survey data. OK, great. And I believe this is the last question. And if I missed anybody, I'm really sorry. There's a lot of conversation flying. But um, a couple of people were interested in knowing if this material is available in a book anywhere, or if it's only in an academic publication, or if you haven't published it yet. So anything you can tell us about that? OK, so I am working on a book on Jewish names of pets. That has not been published anywhere yet. Uh, I don't know when I'm going to finish that, because I have a lot of projects that I'm working on. Um, but the, the information about the historical names is available in this very heavy book and in some articles that are available online. I would recommend looking at the Avotenu website, um, and I will be happy to uh, send a link to that later because they have a lot of resources there. Um, and in terms of, I, I do hope to eventually write a popular book about, about this topic because I find it fascinating and I find that whenever I speak about it in a public setting, people are really interested. And um, so I, I thank you all for your interest. I, I think that um, I uh, am not the only one who finds this topic fascinating. Um, I just wanna end by saying thank you to everyone. Thank you, Esther, for, for moderating today. Thank you to Lex and Dan for all your help uh, and for inviting me to do this series. And thank you to all the participants who really made this possible. Uh, there, this is the last in our series, but uh, I've been asked for an encore. And so I'll be teaching as part of the Shavuot program that Jewish Live is presenting. I'll be speaking on Jewish language used by non-Jews. And just to give you a sneak peek, I'm titling that Pastrami Verklempt and Chutzpa, non-Jews use of Jewish language in the United States. And I'll be talking about uh, how words like klutz, spiel, and kibitz have become part of the broader American lexicon, sometimes popularized by comedians. I'll be talking about how politicians use Hebrew and Yiddish words in diverse ways from Bill Clinton's Shalom Chaver to Michelle Bachman's mispronunciations of chutzpah. And I'll be talking about a much more sinister use of Jewish language, white nationalists mocking Jews with words like goyim. And I'll be showing several video clips from James Cagney portraying a Yiddish speaking Irish taxi driver to Barack Obama getting all verklempt while honoring Barbara Streisand. <laughs> so thank you again to everybody and I'll see you in cyberspace.